Welcome to On the Bubble Podcast, episode 40. I'm your host, Subasa J. Ueda, and with me is my co-host, Yuki Lee Bender. Today, we're going to be doing a deep dive into how to draft Chain for the Monarch draft. I guess that's it, right? We're only talking about Chain today. Yeah. Talk about Chain. Before that, we'll talk about our week. But yeah, we're just going to be doing our um, our Chain episode all about how to, you know, what are some of the key cards? What are some of the archetypes? How to play him? how to get into the deck, all those, all those kinds of things. So it'll be, yeah, we'll be going deep on chain this week and then the other classes or heroes will be coming up next week. Awesome. Okay. Then, um, yeah. So how was your week? Yuki? My week's been pretty good. Played some Monarch draft on the weekend, did two drafts on Sunday and a draft on Monday as well. Played a whole bunch of stuff, drafted a Leviathan deck, a chain deck, a prism deck. So I've been getting some good practice in. it feels good to kind of get reps in the format we kind of mentioned last week that we've drafted this format a number of times but it as i was drafting it i kind of realized like it's been a while since i drafted it so definitely feel like i'm getting some of the rust off and things are coming back to me um but it's been fun i've been really enjoying kind of diving back into monarch draft didn't you say you were gonna draft bolton or force bolton this week yeah that didn't happen (laughs) (laughs) i think um I was thinking about it, and then I realized that the problem was that I don't know what Bolton should look like. So I think what I'm going to have to do is try to build some like 30-card Bolton decks with commons and rares, like maybe like two of each common and one rare, uh, one of each rare kind of thing, and see what that looks like, just so I have an idea of what it is that I'm looking for, because I feel like Right now, I'm just like, I don't even know what a good Bolton deck looks like. So it's like hard to know. Like, I'm not exactly sure what to prioritize. I know, I know, like, Take Flight is good. I know Courageous Steel Hand's pretty good. Um, I know, like, Valiant Thrust is good and V and stuff, but I'm not exactly sure about, like, the combination of cards and everything. That's fair. Well, I know what a good Bolton deck looks like now. The this week on our first Monarch draft, uh, one of the guys went into went 3-0 with Bolton with like the most broken Bolton deck I've seen so far. <laughs> he had Valiant yeah. Dynamo, V of the Vanguard, Spill Blood. Yeah, he was the only Bolton in the pod too, so he had like a bunch of take flights and just good cards. I played him twice with my pretty mediocre Levia deck that was playing like brandishes in it. The brandishes were actually pretty good, but anyways, I played my pretty mediocre Levia deck and I just died on turn like three both games <laughs> <laughs> that's so crazy yeah it's just like he's just like uh yeah i'm gonna go first and uh charge my soul and i'm like okay cool hit you for some damage on his next turn he's hitting me for like 17 or something not even counting like the plus attack from the bolton stuff i'm just like oh cool <laughs> <laughs> guess i die <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah i guess we just go straight into the episode then? Yeah, we can do that. I think we got lots to talk about. Yeah, that sounds good. Do you want to go over like a key gameplay thing? We talked about this on the Monarch overview episode, but uh, let's just go over that to make sure everyone's on the same page. So kind of to summarize, Chain is definitely the kind of hero where you need to have a plan on how you're going to win the game and what that's going to look like. Because of the Soul Shackles, you usually get kind of about five turns, um, assuming you're shackling every turn, after which point like you're pretty much out of deck and unless you have them at like one with an arcane damage left in your deck or something, like you're you're no longer gonna win that game. So you need to have a very clear plan of what that looks like. And we kind of talked about like the two major archetypes. We'll be going into each of those in more detail, but there's like a more aggressive archetype that can just kind of run its opponents over. And there's also a more combo pitch stack oriented build that can that can sort of do 20 plus damage on the last turn fairly reliably that being said it does take some amount of practice sequencing is important with the deck and it's a deck that hopefully after this episode you'll feel comfortable trying out but i would very much recommend drafting it a couple times before you play something like your nationals if you if you are playing that and trying to draft it because having a few reps on the deck and having seen how things play out a few times i think will, will just really help you kind of pick up the deck it's it's hard to do it on the fly and make it all work perfectly the first time i guess at least for me yeah no definitely it's a very difficult deck to do that it's it's gonna be quite difficult if you're gonna try playing the combo version you'll need to know your pitch deck and how the shackles affect your pitch deck 
it's uh, pretty easy once you like get a hang of it, but you it'll be near impossible to do that like if it's your first time picking up the deck and drafting it. So definitely, if you can't do drafts, at least just build like a thirty card draft chaff chain deck and see what these decks end up looking like. And trying that would probably like it would help a lot in in being able to pilot the deck properly. Yeah, and if you do that, I think you can... If, if you do that, or if you draft chain and you have your deck left over, I think it's even the kind of deck you could consider goldfishing a few times just to, like, w- like with intentionally thinking through your pitch and what that looks like and seeing if you can just, like, remember what's in your pitch stack, remember, like, th- think about setting up those end game turns to close out the game and and, and all of that. I think if you just have the repetitions it's going to be a lot easier to do that when there's you know stakes and pressure and you know you're in a match that really matters this is another way you could go about practicing it yeah let's uh just move right into the key cards for this deck so how are we gonna break this up we're gonna talk about just key cards that are good in all versions of chain first and then we'll talk about the actual archetypes later in the episode so let's start with the best cards in the set for chain we're going to talk about the equipment first it's going to be ebon fold aether iron weave and stubbies those are the three equipment that you're going to be looking for to have a successful chain deck no matter what kind what kind of chain you are yeah and of these i think ebon fold and aether iron weave are pretty high picks ebon folds pretty strong in either Levia or Chain, so it's a flexible pick that is also powerful. And then Aether Iron Weave is just so good. Stubbies I do think is good in Chain, but I'm often picking it up a little bit later. Like I kind of want to... It's kind of your reward for being Chain because... I think that's the deck that it fits into best, although Bolton can also play it. I have also started to like Stubby Hammers and Prism now. Cards sweet everywhere, I think, but that might be just like a later episode kind of topic. <laughs> yeah, Jay has discovered that you can just put Belittle Minoism in every deck, and why not? It's pretty good. Yeah, it helps you swing your auras with uh with Belittle. That that being said, let's uh talk about Aether Iron Weave a little bit more in detail. So this card is a uh, Runeblade equipment chest, so only Chain can play it. It has Battle Swarm 1, so it just gains you one life right off the bat. That already is pretty broken. And it has an action ability that has go again that just generates you two resources if you've played a non-attack action and an attack action. So what this basically means, though, is that for you to effectively use Aether Iron Weave, you do need to play a non-attack action. So if you're planning to pop this off on your combo turn, you have to have a non-attack action incorporated in that turn. Uh, I guess for the non for the combo deck, it's just like, there's no way you can kill your opponent with the non-attack actions anyways, right? Yeah, typically. I think there's like some different flavors of it, but you definitely do probably want to have a non-attack action at least. And sometimes, I actually had this on the weekend, I had a deck with like five non-attack actions. It was much lower than I'd like. In that deck, it just meant when I draw something like a red minnowism, I'm arsenaling that and saving it to the last turn because like I just might not, like I might just banish the rest of them and not see them kind of thing. So um, you can definitely, if you know that your pitch deck doesn't have non-attack actions, you can also kind of fix for it by arsenaling a card as well. Mm, I see, I see, just like arsenaling and keeping it there. So on your last turn, you can pop off. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And then another, so then we're going to just talk about, move away from the equipments and talk about arcane damage in general. In this set, arcane damage is very hard to block, right? We don't have any, what is it called? Arcane barrier. Arcane barrier, yes. We don't have any arcane barrier. Uh, There are some cards with spell void, but those are typically actually on cards that have good activated abilities anyways. So it puts your opponent in a spot where if they end up using their spell void on those cards, it actually like turns that card off. So just arcane damage in general is very powerful in this format. And the main two cards that you want to be looking for will be Vexing Malice, which this card actually does two arcane damage on attack, or Arcanic, Ar- Archaic, Arcanic, Archaic, Arcanic, Arcanic, Arcanic yeah. Crackle, which is a one arcane damage on attack. Uh, do you want to talk more about arcane damage in this four chain, I guess? Arcane damage kind of fulfills a couple roles. The first one is that often in chain, your early turns aren't necessarily 
great at pushing damage, you often need like a couple, like it's when you start getting one or two hits off of your shackles that you start really getting these crazy turns for the most part. And Arcane sort of lets you help chip damage early to kind of soften up the opponent and make that you know, like making that spike turn that you need to have to go over the top, not quite as big because you've been whittling them down with arcane damage. It also enables certain cards. So there are payoffs for having dealt arcane damage, like Rip Through Reality, which is a two for four that can be played from Banish. And if you've dealt arcane damage, it has Go Again, as well as Piercing Shadow Vise, which is also a two for four at red that can be played from banish but if you've dealt arcane damage it gets a plus two so it'll be a two for six so um if you have these cards in your deck you also want to have arcane damage in your deck to turn them on although the arcane damage is just good in general as a way to either close the game or soften up the opponent so that you can combo them out and go over the top yeah there's actually an interesting play where you can do not a play but just like a game plan you can have with chain of like if you have if you can count to like 21 with arcane damage you don't actually have to shackle and just play 21 points of arcane damage and your opponent can't actually block it all i wouldn't recommend this as you're just gonna get outvalued by cards that are more efficient than you like prism cards bolt and swinging their axes uh Elevia's just cards in general is just like above rate in general so you'll end up losing the game if you try and count the 20 with only arcane damage but that being said there isn't arcane barrier in the set so if you can count to 20 with arcane damage they are definitely dead i think if the deck is low powered this kind of strategy can be like a good kind of backup plan but if the decks in the pod are high power level the the problem is is like you probably have to block with too many of those arcane cards if you're if your opponent is doing like powerful stuff and there's a lot of powerful things to do in monarch there's no way you're going to be able to play like all those because most of them are like one to two points so you're relying on playing like 20 cards in your deck and just you know it's not happening. your opponents yeah if your opponent's attacking you for 10 a turn you're you're not getting there for example <laughs> <laughs> okay the this is a generic that's just like really good in chain the last card i want to talk about will be tremor of I don't know how to pronounce this card, Yuki. You gotta help me out. I don't know out. either. I think it's Iarathale, but I'm not sure. Yep, I'm not even gonna. I'm not even gonna attempt this card. So I'm just gonna explain it. This is a generic one cost, and it attacks for four for the red one, blocks for two, and it says if a card has been put into your banish zone this turn, Tremor deal. Tremor, Tremor gains two power. Uh, so yellow one attacks for three, blue one attacks for two. And this card is just above rate in chain, because if you have one shackle, then you're always getting a card in banish every single turn. So the red one just naturally attacks for six, the yellow one naturally attacks for five, and the blue one naturally attacks for four, which is just all above rate for their color. Maybe the other generic attack action that you can look out for that is not nearly as powerful, but is still good in chain, is Yinti Yanti. This is a 0 for 3 that blocks 2 at red, but it gets plus 1 attack and plus 1 defense if you have an aura. And notably, soul shackles are auras. So similarly, so long as you've made a soul shackle, which you can do for free, Yinti Yanti is basically a wounded bull. Wounded, wounded blow. 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 Uh, yeah, the, the 4 for 0 from... WTR. So this is not like a reason to draft chain. It's not even like a crazy powerful card. It's about as good as Wounded Blow is. It's just that you tend to get this card late because most other decks don't want it. Prism is the only other deck that can have an aura, but is far less reliable than chain. And so it's kind of like a reward for being chain that you can pick up late in the pack that you can keep an eye out for. That's it's just very solid. Yeah. So don't pick this highly, but expect to get it in the wheel, I think is the best way to visualize this card is like, you see it in like pack three, you'll be like, okay, I'm going to be chain and I'm probably the only one that wants this card. Yeah, exactly. Other attack actions that are worth mentioning, um, Soul Reaping is a big one. This is a six cost, six power attack 
that blocks for three. But it has an alternate cost of being able to banish any number of cards from your hand uh, instead of paying its resource cost. So really, you banish a card from your hand and it attacks for six. Additionally, if you've banished any blood debt cards, you get one resource for each blood debt card banished that way. So the idea is if you have like two seeds of agony in your hand, you can soul reaping, banish the two seeds of agony that have blood debt, you get two resources, and then you can play those blood debt cards from your banish. So you're not really even down those cards at all. Soul reaping is one of the best cards in the set, I think, for draft. It's just super, super powerful. And I think would be happy to pack one, pick one this card. It's like a huge reason to be chain. Um, and if anybody ever passes this to me, I'm taking it as a very strong signal that like I'm almost just picking it and just forcing chain at that point. If I, especially if it's like pick three or something, I'm like, okay, the two people passing to me are not chain. Yeah, that's a good heuristic to have. The other thing, a common misconception with this card, the card you banish does not have to have blood debt. You can banish any card, including generics without blood debt or just random shadow cards. It's just a alternate cost to playing the card. It only checks to see if blood debt to generate resources. And then the other thing with this card would be the last line of text. This is while soul reaping is attacking a hero with one or more cards in their soul has go again. One thing you do have to be careful about is against Prism. If they remove their card in soul before the resolution step, is it resolution step where go again resolves? I think it's technically the link step, but they can just do it anytime during reactions or during like, yeah, during the resolution when all the hit triggers would happen. Okay, yeah. So before the link step, if uh, Prism makes a spectral shield, like even after damage, then Soul Reaping will lose go again and it's just, or it, will, it won't have gained go again. You could have a turn where it completely falls apart just because you forgot to, or you forgot that this card can lose go again. So that's just like the two things that you should keep in mind about this card. That this card is easier to play than you think, and that this card sometimes loses go again if they can remove all cards in their soul. Yeah, in general, if Prism has exactly one card in soul, you need to be careful of that because they can just, activate their hero ability and and clear it out if they have two cards in soul there's no real way for her to take care of two cards out of soul at once uh so the next couple of cards will be just generic good cards for chain uh this is gonna be ghostly touch red and void wraith red these cards basically do the exact same thing there are shadow action attacks and they can both be played from the banished zone the Ghostly Visit Red is a 1 cost attacks 4, Void Wraith is a 2 cost attacks for 5. Just good efficient cards. When you hit these off Blood Debt, they are just really solid. And even when you're, they're in your hand, they're like slightly below rate, but not too bad. And the upside of being able to get extra cards from your Blood Debt more than makes up for it. Yeah, that's just like, when you naturally get these off of like Shackles, it's, it feels like you just drew an extra card, like really. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you pretty much did. Maybe the final attack action to talk about that's at rare is Unhallowed Rights. It's also a one for four, and it has the clause that you can play it from Banish only if you've played a non-attack action this turn. And when it attacks, you can put a non-attack action with Blood Debt onto the bottom of your deck. So from, from your graveyard. Fr- from your graveyard onto the bottom of your deck. So this works really well with Seeds. This also works really well with Howl and is just a free way to set up your second cycle pitch stack where you are have that one last big turn with a bunch of blood extra blood deck cards you just get to do that for free because you don't even have to pitch the card you can just play your unhallowed uh sorry play your howl from beyond earlier in the game then play your unhallowed rights and put it on the bottom of your deck so that you get to draw it again in your pitch stack for example yep uh just a small rules thing all non-attack actions that you play immediately go to the graveyard, unlike the combat chain cards. So if you play, let's say, Howl from Beyond right before on Hollow Rights, and then played on Hollow Rights, Howl from Beyond is technically in your graveyard, so you can bottom deck the Howl, and then the Howl will still give this card plus three attack if you're playing the Red Howl. So just keep in mind that the card you the non-attack action card you played from Banish that turn, you can still bottom deck as well. Yeah, and maybe other one other rules thing about this card is that if you do bottom a non-attack action, just keep in mind that you still played it if you're also playing a rift bind on that turn because rift bind just cares that the card was played it i know like a lot of people like to leave the non-attack actions out so that it's like easy to track with rift bind and you you can do that but just remember that if you do bottom a blood deck card it's still 
that card still was played and still buffs your rift bind so just make sure you're not losing value there unhollowed rights is like such a cool card and good design and stuff like that but then when you like actually play with the card it like creates these like really awkward situations where it'd be like oh wait Oh, I forgot Rift Bind should have been like five instead of four last turn. Or even small things like, oh, I put the seeds in the bottom. I forgot I've actually dealt arcane damage last turn. Then my piercing shadow vi should have been six instead of four. It's it, it creates some some awkward things like that sometimes. Yeah. So just stuff to look out for if you're playing it. I guess uh, just lastly, we touched on this last week uh, on the monarch overview, but poppers are still good. In Chain, you get to play Lunar Tide Plunders, which is a shadow card that just is a 3 for 7, and the yellow one's a 3 for 6. So you get those in addition to the generic 6 six power poppers. Yeah, and they're all pretty strong. The shadow ones are especially nice because you can give them go again with Soul Shackle, but you can still pretty comfortably end on like a rally the rear guard or something and, and that's also totally fine i was thinking about surging militia surging militia is still good in chain two um this is a red two for five if it's blocked by non-equipment it gets plus one power we'll talk a little bit more about surging militia a little bit later in this episode but this card is good too so just keep that in mind okay on to the non-attack actions first up Surprise to nobody, probably is seeds of agony the card was banned and constructed um it just deals one it it essentially deals one arcane and can be played from blood debt. Um, there, keep in mind that you do have to be able to trigger it, and notably the blue seeds only triggers if you only gives the one arcane damage if you play a attack action with cost zero. So if you are relying on things like blue seeds, you do need to have something like a bounding demagon to be able to trigger them. But yeah, these are essentially free arcane damage that you can pitch stack. I personally like the yellow and the blue ones the best because you can just pitch them early, like. You don't really want to be, if you draw it, you don't really want to be playing a card for one value. But if you pitch it as a resource card and then in the late game get it for free off of your soul shackles, it ends up being very powerful. Uh, that being said, don't discount the red seas of agony. I think if yeah. you see it, you probably just need to pick it just because you can still pitch this card. It only generates one mana, but it does one damage later in the game when you banish it off the pitch stack on the soul shackle. So even if it only generates you one resource, it still does one damage. So it's like an opposite of a hard offendal, basically, where you pitch it, it, get, it gets you resources, and it does one damage instead of gaining your life. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking of it. And it can often be more than one damage if you combine it with, uh, again, the classic constructed combo of Rift Bind, which we can talk about it now, but it's a one for three with blood debt, and it gets if you play it if you play it from banish, it gets plus one for each non-attack action you've played this turn. And so, you know, with C, your seeds is now effectively two damage. If you're playing two rift binds in the in the turn, your seeds is now effectively three damage. So it's like a three damage blue that you pitch to the bottom of your deck in the right setup. So yeah, seeds is just really really strong, and it's the only non-attack action with blood debt that you can really reliably get at common it's the only non-attack yeah. action yeah it's just straight up the only one it's the only one at common there's there's a couple of rares which are also on this list of premiums but non-attacks with blood debt are premium because there's just way more attacks than non-attacks basically yeah yeah that's a good way of saying it uh, the next card on the list will be Hal from Beyond Red. This one specifically has to be the red one on like seeds. This card gives the next attack action plus three power, and it has blood dead and can be played from your banish. It's very similar to Seeds of Agony. I think I would almost always pitch this card if I can, just because it's better on the second cycle anyways. But this one in particular, you could play from your hand. It's not like that that bad it is a two for three go again so it's like pretty below rate but that being said like if you're like desperate to play the non-attack action this turn like it's not the worst playing from your hand yeah it pairs well with stuff like bounding demagon because you get the bounding from like if you flip the bounding off the top with soul shackle howl bounding is seven damage off two resources and it essentially costs you only one card because of the like only the howl you had to draw uh, one one card and two resources, but but still 
it's actually pretty sweet if you have like unhollowed rights if you naturally vanish on unhollowed rights if you do howl into unhollowed then the howl actually just goes back to the bottom of the deck so it's like you've pitched it anyways yeah and, and something worth noting is that if you have unhollowed rights you can you can and probably will want to play your howl and then bottom it with the unhollowed rights later in the game and then the next card will be seeping Sha- seeping shadows yellow and blue this card is i guess we should explain the card real quick one second so sheep seeping shadows blue i'm gonna read this one it costs three and it says you may play seeping shadow from your banished zone the next attack action card with cost zero you play this turn gains plus one power and go again this card has go again and is a has blood debt and notably the power isn't what scales up with pitch it's the restrictiveness of it so the blue is only zero costs or less the reds are one cost or less sorry the the yellow is one cost or less and the the red gives go again to anything two cost or less so while the red is more flexible really you kind of want to be pitching this card and getting it because again three resources for an action point and a card is like three resources and a card for an action point and one damage is like way 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 below rate but if you can pitch it to your second cycle and have a big combo turn with this and it's kind of instrumental in that because it gives you an extra action point to play all of your cards then uh, suddenly it's a very good card and for that reason the yellows and the blues are are much better than the red because you can pitch them and not be too far below rate when you do that. Just a another point, uh, if you do end up playing like a red seeping shadows, this card gives any attack action with cost two or less plus one and go again. So it can give your generics go again as well. I do see some people misunderstanding this card that it has to be like a shadow card or a rune blade card like chains ability, but that's not true. This card will give any attack action go again and the power if uh if you need to yeah definitely oh the next card would be minnowism red so this is part of the belittle minnowism package but you don't need to have belittle for minnowism to be good it's essentially just a hmm, what is that card called nimbleism ah yeah nimbleism it's exactly like nimbleism right yeah essentially but Nimbleism is also particularly good in chain because I guess the he has a lot of stuff that's power three or less, especially because his base power. So like Rift Bind and Bounding Demigon at red just get hit by Minimalism naturally. Um, you also want non-attack actions because stuff like Unhallowed Rights and Bounding Demigon require you to play a non-attack action uh, in order to play them at all. And then Rift Bind gets pumped up by your non-attack actions. So Minimalism is just one of the best ways to do that three for zero go again at red is just really good yeah it ends up just being like a head jab that turns on your turns and playing that card at red is is the perfect perfect color to do it the yellow and the blue is just like significantly worse uh the blue is obviously playable if you're playing belittle but if you don't have belittle then just the red one is good and if you are playing belittle the red one is really good so yeah (laughs) And then finally, our last non-attack action here is Warmonger's Recital. This is a one for three, uh, one for plus three on your next attack. Um, So not quite as efficient as the Minoism, but it works on any attack. And additionally, it gives that attack if it hits, that attack goes to the bottom of your deck. So again, we've been talking about the importance of your pitch stack, but this card can enable some really good things. Like if if you hit a red Rift Bind early and you can't really afford to leave it there to keep getting blood debt um, if you play a warmongers recital into the red rift bind it gets plus three from the warmongers plus one from the uh from having played a non-attack action and is coming in for seven uh which is an awkward break point and if it hits then you have a red rift bind in your pitch stack for your combo turn so um it has just has some really nice play patterns and just getting to send your blood deck cards it works in a similar way with like ghostly touch you can two for seven with a ghostly touch and goes to the bottom of your deck if it hits which is just really really strong because it's like it's almost like a delayed card draw if it hits yeah yeah and even better than that chain can give the ghostly touch or rift bind go again and you have if you pitch the blue you have one resources left to like swing your galaxy block that's already turned on now yeah so all of a sudden you're kind of doing the math right you pitch a blue and a warmongers recital and you if you have a ghostly touch like already in your banish or you hit it off the top you're dealing seven damage plus three for the galaxy black is like a two card ten which is just insane 
Yeah, with uh, on hit pseudo draw card and on hit the uh, one arcane on the galaxy block. Yeah, and it works with a whole bunch of cards. It works with unhallowed rights, rift bind, bounding, ghostly. Very, very good. Just super solid. Honestly, red warmonger recital just a pretty strong card in the set in general. Like almost all the heroes want this card. Yeah, it's just very good. Okay, so those were mostly all of the key cards or just good cards in like all versions of Chain. Some of the other cards you think are good might just be for like a specific version of Chain or we're going to talk about an aggro Chain list and a combo endgame Chain list and we'll talk about more cards there. But before we go into that, let's talk about the Majestics and if they're either good or unplayable. So we're talking about the good ones first. I think pretty obviously or it might might not even be obvious shadow of ursa is a very very good card it's a blue zero for two you can play it from your banner stone and it blocks three it's an attack and it says that as an additional cost to play shadow of ursa you may banish a card with blood debt from your hand and if you do it gains go again and it has blood debt this is a great way to go wide it's also a resource card that has blood debt and goes wide on your combo turn at the end the cost of banishing a blood deck card is again not really a cost assuming you wanted to play that card anyways so yeah it's just like what is it it's like a blue but it comes in as if it's a yellow head jab and it blocks three which is already a good card and then you can also just pitch it and draw it for free later yeah like honestly the first time I read this card, or even now when I read this card and look at it, I'm just like, how is this card on a raid or good? And then you play with this card like four or five times and you're just like, okay, yeah, Shadow of Ursa just like enables the most disgusting of turns in chain. And Shadow of Ursa is just like an all-rounder, just A+. plus. Yeah, it's like kind of subtly powerful, but it's just this like... It's like a great glue piece. It just kind of like ties the whole deck together and it does everything you want. It's like you can draw it and play it and it's still pretty okay. You can pitch it for late game and it helps your combo turn. Like it just it just does everything. Would you draft this card highly though? It's a good question. I might, honestly. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I think if I know I'm in chain, this card becomes like a super high pick. But I don't know if I'll move into chain for Shadow Versor. Yeah, I guess it depends on the pack. I think it's like right on that line. I would consider picking it. Um, Like I could pack one, pick one this card and be like reasonably happy with it. I don't know. I I feel like there's probably better pack one, pick ones, but it's still pretty solid. I think I agree with that. The next Majestic on this list will be Invert Existence. This card is very good. You do need to be careful about who you play this card into, but almost every deck in the format should play non-attack actions. The and in the mirror, it can get very awkward, but at the same time, very powerful. I don't know how to explain the power level on this card. It's just, it doesn't take an action because it's an instant. So it's like one cost, deal two unblockable damage. That's also a blue and goes into your pitch stack for your combo turn because you can play it from banish for free. So it's just a blue that you pitch. And then at the end game, you just get to at some point go one resource deal two unblockable to you. So it's like a blue that almost makes your opponent start with two less life, assuming they have attacks and non-attacks, which is... It's almost any deck. It, I guess it's like almost like it's almost like equipment in terms of power level because... Like you don't have to draw it. Like even though like you do draw it and it's in your deck and like you may do it that way, like often you don't have to draw this card because of shackle to get its value. Mm-hmm. A cool line to do as well with this card, if you're playing the mirror, is you can intentionally give them cards with blood debt that they can play again to do four unblockable damage. So if after they've played their all their cards with their action point, if you invert existence and give them like a bounding demigod and a uh, and a howl from beyond or something. Uh, it'll do this card will do, do two damage to them, and then they'll take two more from blood debt. So it's like four unblockable for one resource, which is insane. Yeah, you can just kind of kill people out of nowhere with it, which is really nice. Uh, one thing to note though is if you do that, and if they don't die, then those howl and boundings is going to come back at you. So just be careful on that, and maybe not do that unless your opponent's actually going to die. All right, the next card is Shadow Puppetry. 
again, this card says Hawk Constructed Play, so maybe that's just like a good heuristic for chain is like if you know what the constructed chain decks look like and that card was in the constructed chain deck, it's probably good. Um, there's other good cards too, but but yeah. Shadow Puppetry is a red zero cost that blocks two. It's a non-attack action, and it says the next attack action card you play gains go again and plus one attack. And if this hits, uh, look at the top card of your deck, you may banish it. So yeah, just giving your... Because you have so many extra cards with Blood Debt, giving plus one attack and go again to one of them is just really strong and it's a non-attack which you want some of anyways and uh, it also gives like i don't know if half of your deck is blood debt then this will draw a card half of the time because you can banish a card roughly yeah 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 on hit it's it's like pseudo card draw it's like draw half a card yeah it depends on how much blood debt cards you have in your deck the more you do the the higher this card is like a draw card and lower the count the the less that on hit matters but at the same time, how does your opponent know? It's always like scary to let this card hit. Yeah, your opponent can never actually know if how condensed you are. And to them, it's basically like, oh, they get to draw a card. And again, non-attacks premium. There's just not that many good ones. Let's uh, talk about Sonata then. Sonata is a, um, it's an interesting one. So this one is a Runeblade action card, non-attack action. And it costs XX, so X can be zero. This says, reveal the top X plus three cards of your deck. For each non-attack action, reveal this way, put an action card revealed this way into your hand. Deal an arcane damage for each card you added. Shuffle your deck after this card resolves. And let's go again. Personally, I don't think this card is that good in draft because it's so hard to get non-attack actions. But this card can turn into a premium if you have like the nice... Nice 50-50 split on attack actions and non-attack actions. Uh, Where do you lie on this card? I feel like I just never have the 50-50 split on attack actions and non-attack actions, so I kind of don't like this card. Like, how early would you pick this card? Like, if let's say there's like... I I don't think I'd pick this card. I, I think... I think there'd either have to be like nothing else relevant in the pack, really, or I already have like multiple non-attack actions and I can play it. Because like I just feel like yeah, I don't know. I feel like just having it early is not like it. You can draft around it, but I don't know that it's worth drafting around, and it's still going to be hard to get the non-attack actions. I think it also will mess with your pitch stack, which like might just make it not worth it in general because. In draft, you hit your pitch really fast. Like, 30 cards is not very many. It's uh, four turns, and you hit your pitch stack, something like that. Four, yeah. eight, 12, plus 10. Sorry, five turns. On your fifth turn, you're definitely at your pitch stack. I don't like Sonata. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Then next, we'll talk about Dimensional Crossroads. I didn't like this card, but right before the episode, we are talking about it. I think Yuki brought me up on this card. Why do you think this card is good? It being a yellow block three that's also a non-attack action, and we've been talking about that importance is like a lot of what makes this card kind of acceptable. Um, It can just do some stuff. It is pretty far below rate in most decks, but I had a game where I opened this on turn zero, and I just got to play this, and it helped me also pitch deck my second cycle without, without letting my opponent filter. And I think it did like three or four arcane damage, which is just, um, yeah, my opponent basically just started with three or four less life. So I don't know that this card is a super high pick, but certainly going first, I would, I think, always play this card just for the upside of it. If you're low on non-attack actions and you need them, it's still pretty solid. Yeah, I think that's fair. And you're just saying that this is just like a yellow block three. So, you know, any card that blocks three is like, you can just block with it. And that really just blew my mind. I was like, oh yeah, you don't have to play this card. You can just block with it and you'll be happy with it. Yep. Yeah, it's just fine. And I always forget like a lot of the non-attack actions only block for two. So you do want like a lot of non-attack actions, but the more you have, the less your deck blocks. And this card being a non-attack action that blocks for three is like, that's solid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just pretty okay. And then finally, Dread Scythe, Majestic Weapon, once per turn action, uh, pay three resources and attack for three. And whenever you attack with Dread Scythe, deal one arcane, arcane damage to defending hero. This is just an attack trigger. It doesn't have to hit. Also, a hero dealt damage by Dread Scythe can't gain life during their next action phase. The The gain life is like basically irrelevant. I guess like Lumina Ascension can technically gain life, but 
it's, it's not really going to come up for the most part. But this card is, I think you can build around this card if you get it. I've never been able to do it myself, but just, you can almost like play a guardian deck where you just play three blocks and then pitch a blue Dread Scythe for three and one unblockable over and over again. And it's probably pretty okay. Yeah, honestly, I've done it once. It's uh, if you pack one, pick one, or Dread Scythe, then you actually get to warp all of your picks. Uh, any three block becomes premium. Uh, you actually don't need to shackle that often with a Dread Scythe. You just don't need to. If you go block for nine, Dread Scythe, it's just like a 13 damage turn cycle. And if you do that over and over again, the one unblockable will start to whittle down your opponent. This card will start doing very good things with like Archaic Crack, Arcanic Crackle, Vexing Malice, um, generic two cost reds that attack for a lot. Um, if you have Rip Through Realities, you can go Dread Scythe, deal one Arcane. Now Rip Through always hits for four go again. Uh, same with Piercing Shadow Vise. Uh, if you go Dread Scythe, uh, Chain, Soul Shackle, Dread Scythe to give that card go again. Then pitch another card to Piercing Shadow Vise for six from Banish is pretty strong. There's just like a lot of good like... Dread Scythe becomes like a really good like one, two, maybe three Shackle Chain deck where you stop, shack stop making Soul Shackles at like one or two shackles and you play like seven or eight maybe nine turns with dread scythe and honestly it's just like a it's like a deck on its own and you don't get to draft this unless you open a dread scythe but when you do pack one pick one and dread scythe it's pretty pretty powerful honestly yeah i haven't gotten to do this but um it's very much a card that you need to have built around so if you see it early you can do it but like if you're getting this like late pack three, this probably just this probably doesn't just slot into your chain dark. That's a good question, actually. Is this card just always better than Galaxy Block? I don't know if it is. I think it would probably depend on your blue count. Like to play Dread Scythe, I would want a high blue count. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would like 15, 16 blues, honestly. Yeah, because like ideally you're giving this go again and then you're doing other stuff. And I think it gets better with stuff like like the rips and piercing shadow vice that you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. But I think you need a high blue count. And if you don't have that, it's a little bit awkward. I don't know if I would be inclined to play this card. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's still just fine as a way to close out the game in the end game. Yeah. Actually, it's pretty interesting. Like, if you're playing this card in, like, the aggro version of the chain, if you just make sure you keep one blue, then this is the arcane damage that you're missing, you know, at the end of the game to close out if you really need to. Yeah. Maybe it's just good. I don't know. If any of our listeners have experience with this card and just like a situation where you didn't get to build around it um we'd love to hear about your your thoughts down in the comments that'd be mm -hmm. really interesting to hear about yeah if you get this late anyways like if you're i would like probably pick things like seeds of agony over this card anyways but like if it comes to you like pack three pick five or something i would probably just pick it up and it might be like a small upgrade to galaxy black the other non the other majestics i think we're just going to kind of skip over but Mutated Mass is not fantastic. Tome of Torment and Guardian of the Shadow Realm are... Can I say that these cards are like not cards you should be putting in your deck? Is that fair to say? Yeah, I would almost never play those cards. Mutated Mass is, is like a pet card for me. Um, you can do some very, very interesting pitch stack. Like you can try and make sure that the cards you draw are zero cost, one cost, and two cost. By like intentionally pitching like a red two cost or something like that but it's like you can do you can be very creative with muted mass and it could win you games but i think it would kill you more often than not so i would stay away from it unless you really want to like put yourself through that hellhole <laughs> yeah it, it's probably okay in the combo version now that i think about it because you often pitch two blues so it's probably okay there it can be like kind of like a blue ghostly visit that doesn't block which is fine but but yeah this card is even though it's majestic like you probably want to steer away from it yeah tomo torment guardian just don't play it to tomo torment is 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 awkward it's always awkward it's just don't do it it's it doesn't have go again is the problem and it only draws one card it's just like yeah it doesn't do anything that you need you can shackle it but like you're usually more gated on action points than you are in need of like an extra a card card. yeah 
it's uh it's awkward it's like it can come in clutch where it's like you ha- you're like forced to block with all four cards in hand so you go like shackle tomor torment and pitch it to now attack with your weapon might be cool but like it's uh yeah it's not it's not exactly what you want to be doing okay you want to carry on to the archetypes here yeah let's do that so we've been talking about it there's sort of this more aggressive focused chain deck and a more combo focused chain deck i think that you can actually kind of think of these as a little bit of a spectrum like i think you can go really hard in either direction and i think you can also play something in the middle that has like a little bit of an aggro package and then a little bit of a combo package and its combo is like not quite as big but still enough to close out the close of the game so there's there's like a little bit of a sliding scale here we've spent so long talking about different cards that are just good in chain which i think should tell you that there's a lot of overlap between these archetypes and you can often decide which one you are kind of later in the draft as you start having more cards in your pool it's not like you need to be deciding right away this is the one that i'm drafting um, you can kind of figure it out as you go along based on what cards you're seeing yeah, the one caveat to this will be belittle minimalism. Belittle will, if you are using belittle to look for your deck for a minimalism, it shuffles your deck. And if you shuffle your deck, your combo end game will be very difficult to set up. So the if you are playing belittle as like a way to find minimalism, then it could just make it so that you can't really do a combo end game unless. I don't know. Is that even possible to play Belittle in a combo version of the deck? I think you can still play it, but you need to be careful about... You basically don't want to shuffle if you're too far down your... Like, too late into the game. But if it's on turn, like, the first, like, one or two turns of the game, you can do it, and it's pretty okay. Um, Yeah, Mm -hmm. that's basically what I would say. But I think it's also just fine. Like, one for three go again is... Like, it sounds kind of silly, but it's actually fine in a chain. Um, you have so many cards that, again, the action points are a big concern, and just finding more ways to have go again is is pretty powerful. The aggro version of chain, uh, I like to play, like, even yellow and blue belittles to go look for minimalisms. If you go that far, then you definitely can't play that combo and game, because then you're, like, constant, constantly shuffling your deck with uh, finding minimalism over and over again. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, So maybe jumping into the aggro deck outside of Belittle and obviously Minoism, what other cards are kind of defining that aggro chain deck for you? The cards I really like in this deck would be Rip Through Reality. I think this is, um, as we keep on saying that this chain gets gated by action points, Rip Through Reality is the two cost attack action. At red, it attacks for four. And if you've dealt Arcane, this card has go again. It's not the easiest to deal Arcane, but combined with a card called Rifted Torment, which is a card they also like in the aggro version of Chain, which is also a two cost that attacks for four. But if it's played from a Banish Zone, it does one Arcane damage. So what you can actually set up turns is if you start with a Belittle, finding a blue Minoism, um, and the card you revealed is also blue, then you have five resources um left over after playing belittle you can go something like belittle chain make a soul shackle rift the torment deal one, one arcane attack for four rip through reality for four attack with galaxy of black so you end up attacking four three from belittle four from rip four from rifted one arcane and three from galaxy black and you can have these like pretty consistent go wide attack for three four four three kind of turns continuously um and to do that you just need like multiple copies of these two cost play from banish zones and i think that's what really like makes these aggro these aggro turns really powerful is on like shackle two and three if you can keep on consistently doing this kind of like very high tempo turns that's how you like really win with the aggro version that makes sense and then um maybe the Another question for you is how many blues are you playing in the aggro version? Because it sounds like there's quite a few two costs in there. Yeah, so in this version, you are playing like all the generic two costs, like end your turn with it as well. So you have like a bunch of the poppers as well. For this version, I think minimum you need nine. And I play up to like 13 or even 14 blues in this deck. 
That being said, I count every color of belittle as a blue. So, like, if I have two red belittles and a blue middle was in my deck, then that will count towards the blue count. So I could have, like, ten blues and, like, two red belittles and a yellow belittle, and that'll be my 13 blues kind of thing. I don't know. Is it fair to say, like, my feeling on this, I kind of agree with that, but I also feel like I don't really want to go below, like, maybe, like, eight actual blues like if i think if you start counting like i have like five blues in my deck and i have like four belittles like that's getting a little sketch for me Ooh, that is that is true but if you have four belittles like it always because chains card almost all activate like you can reveal for belittle even if you go like pitch let's say like a red seeds of agony to play belittle find the minnowism you could turn that into like a real turn so i would try and get at least like six seven blues at a minimum but yeah like once you dip below six you probably do just need to pick like any playable blue card just just to get your blue count up and then what is uh how are you deciding when to play more like nine or more like 13 is that is a lot of that like the amount the amount of belittles that you have or or does it depend on the kind of blue cards you have access to this just really comes down to like how many two costs that i have that can be played from banish the more copies of rifted torments and rip through reality the more blues you just need to be able to go basically play out your your banish zone or your hand the more two costs that you can play for banish the more blues you need i don't really have an exact number but if you have like four rifted torments in your deck you probably need to be closer to the you know double digit blue counts and the less rifted torments and like the more bounding demigon type of cards you have the less blues you actually need that makes a lot of sense anything else about the aggro chain deck before you carry on yeah i think the last thing will be uh two cost generics i think i talked about surging militia earlier in the episode this is like a great spot for surging militia where you do these like really smaller attacks in the beginning and you end with like a surging militia um they either have to like just eat the five or they have to block this card to like prevent the most amount of damage and the more you're forcing your opponent to block the better surging militia gets uh so same with like stony woot hog and just honestly any of the two costs for six uh in this set even cards like adrenaline rush is just like very powerful which you can do for two for seven at the very end you are going to be needing this like higher damage output end game. Even cards like Elk Muscle and Pound for a Pound. Just, just high numbers are very good in this version of the deck. And Chain is very susceptible to getting decked out. And if you don't have enough damage and you're only coming in for like 3-3-3-3-3, three, 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 you're going to get decked out. So you just do need to make sure you have the the 5s and the 6s and the 7s in your deck to be able to close out the game. Makes makes a lot of sense. Uh, one other play to look out for with Surging Militia is if you can ever increase its power, it's very hard to deal with. Like if you can play uh, Red Warmongers into Surging Militia, come in for 8. It's just so hard to deal with because every card they add ends up increasing its power so even if they give you like three three blocks it gets pumped for three and they're still so it goes up to 11 and they're still leaking two um so if they actually want to fully block this out it actually just takes four three blocks to block out so just like a really good way to close games and i think you can kind of keep that in mind and apply that to any hero in the format there's multiple pumps in the format and surging militia is a generic and just in general it's really good at closing games if you especially if you can pump it do you want to explain a little bit more about the combo side of the deck yeah so when you're leaning more into the combo end game you are hoping to have multiple cards in blood debt at the end of the game in your banish and just kind of have like a very large combo turn it's actually pretty flexible in terms of how you can set up your combo i think you can one of my big takeaways after having drafted more is that you can make a lot out of a little in this deck so long as you kind of have some of the key pieces so one thing is that you can definitely do your rift bind seeds and non-attack actions as like a big combo finish and that's really strong and something to keep an eye out for Um, but i don't think it's the only way to go about this and 
in addition to having all these seeds and all these non-attack actions to pump up your rift binds, I think the other thing that you really need to have is some way to get extra action points because I actually had this happen the other just just yesterday where my chain opponent I think played four yeah four seeds into double rift bind uh, so that's fourteen damage plus the four arcane. Uh, 18 damage turn, which is pretty good, but like I could block six on both of the rift binds. So I took two and I leaked four arcane. I, I leaked six overall. And that was kind of the extent of his combo turn. And he really needed like one more big attack at the end that I can no longer block because I've given up all my cards to start pushing that into the like, instead of taking six, if he, if he can like add a six or a five to the end, then I'm taking like 11 damage kind of thing, which is very different. Um, so you need some way to get those extra action points. Some of the common ways you can do it is Seeping Shadow, Yellow, or Blue. We talked about this card previously, but it's really important in this archetype. You can also play Time Skippers, which kind of does a similar job. You can pitch a blue to get an action point, and on your final turn, um, that can be a really, really good way to go a little bit extra wide. Another nice one is a captain's call especially at blue or yellow it can go into your pitch stack there's a bit of a trick you can do to make sure that you draw it well we'll talk about that in a minute and then finally uh, you have rip through reality i think the yellow and blue rip through reality are pretty real cards in this combo deck and i think that there's kind of like if you don't have the rift bind seeds version like i played a combo version of chain that was actually based around rip through realities and i had i don't i think i had one seeds in the deck the key thing here is that yellow rip with stubbies is basically just red rip through reality. But if your curve is relatively low, you can pitch them. So I was setting up end games with like two to three rip through realities plus like whatever else. And that's already really good. <laughs> like that's already like a lot of damage, right? So I think that's like another way that you can do it. You just need to make sure you have arcane, whether that's um Yellow Rifted Torment works really well because, again, with Stubbies, it's basically Red Rifted Torment, um, and it will turn it on for free. You can also use uh, Seeds to turn it on pretty easily, but you you do need to make sure you have that. So yeah, you're kind of co assembling this big combo turn, and any equipment you can have is also key to kind of going over the top and creating that spike turn. So Stubbies is good, Time Skippers is good, and Aether, Iron Weave, and Evenfold are good in general, but I think they're kind of crucial to this combo deck because... Again, to play so many cards and play all these rip through realities, like the two resources from Aether Iron Weave just does so much. And Evenfold is a really interesting card in the combo deck because I guess um, we can read Evenfold. It's a shadow uh, headpiece that has Spell Void 2, and it has an instant ability that costs one red and you destroy it. And then you can banish a card from your hand, and if it's a shadow card, you draw a card. Now, the really cute interaction here in your last turn is that every soul shackle happens during your action phase, and you get priority before every single soul shackle. So you can actually even fold in response to a soul shackle to draw a card. And this is really powerful because something you can practice doing is tracking where like a key card that you want to draw is in your pitch stack and knowing like the way that I do this is like, okay, my third shackle is going to be maybe my blue captain's call that we talked about earlier. And then I can do my first two shackles and then respond to my third shackle by ebb and folding, banishing a card, drawing that blue captain's call that I want to draw. And then I have my extra action point. Um, the most common thing that you're looking for here is a blue to draw into just so you have lots of resources but you can also sometimes want something like um like a red minnowism for example just to pump up your rift binds and give you your non-attack action that you need so there, there are other things that you can have but most frequently it's a blue that you're looking for yeah that play is pretty sick it's really funny though sometimes i'm watching yuki play and she's like like you can clearly see that she's like thinking really hard, but she's not exactly sure what the order is on the banish, and she's like sitting there for like two minutes. An ebon, like she has her ebon fold in her hand, and she's already pitched for it, but she doesn't know where to use it. It's like, do I banish one more card? Yes, no. Think, 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 think. Banish. 
okay, is it the next card now? <laughs> it it definitely is a little bit tricky and rewards practice. I would say that since I think I'm, I've moved away from trying to remember my pitch stack and instead just remember the position of the card. So I remember it is, it's going to be my third shackle. And then if I ever, let's say like I don't, I can't use a card in my hand and my shackle moves, then I'll know that, well, it's going to be one deeper because I didn't, I missed a card draw. So it never went from three down to four. And then if I end up doing something that accelerates me towards my pitch stack, like I don't know, like a shadow puppetry bans a card, uh, banishes a card, for example. Then I go one card deeper and it becomes one card closer. So if it was at three, now it's going to be my second one. And I just try to remember that number. And for me, that has been kind of the most reliable way to do it. You can sort of, um, you can sort of do the math of like, I'm going to draw four, then shackle like two cards, then I'm going to draw four, shackle three cards, draw four, shackle four cards and so on and see i actually count my deck and count it in that way and figure out exactly where it's going to be in my in my pitch when i'm setting up this combo is uh i guess a common question would be after that would be would you shackle no matter what in this deck then like even if you didn't have a card to play after the go again card or like let's say you don't even have a card that can gain go again would you just shackle no matter what typically unless you know that you need to pitch your fi- uh, fix your pitch stack um, if you know that it's off and not shackling will fix it you can do that but typically you're just always shackling because usually it's usually it's pretty on rails I, g- I guess we can talk about it now but the the pitch stack math is basically if you have if you play 34 cards and you go first the first card that you pitch will be the first card that you shackle on your last turn. That doesn't mean you always have to play 34, but it's a good number to have in your head. So for example, you could play 33 cards and pitch a blue to start, and then know that everything after that blue is going to be your pitch stack, and that way you have a blue for sure in your in your last turn, and that's like also like a totally reasonable thing to do. I think usually I'm playing like 32 to 34 cards. You don't want to be playing... But you don't want to be playing bad cards and going a little bit low to guarantee a blue or two in your last hand is like still pretty good. Mm, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's uh just like having this number of like 34 going first is like really good. How does this change if you're going second? It's sort of hard to calculate because it depends how many cards people strip from your hand. Basically, the way that I would think about it is so your your default is if you go first the first card that you pitch is going to be the first card that you banish on your last shackle if you end up drawing cards like let's say you block with two cards on your first turn and so now you're two cards deeper into your pitch stack so that means you're still going to be shackling cards but you're going to be shackling like two random cards that you don't know what they are so basically what this means is that your your shackle turn at the end is um there's going to be less known cards in your in your banish, essentially. But typically, you are still pitching for your second, for your for your final shackle. If they if they take your full four, it does get a little bit awkward. Mm, okay, is maybe a easier way of thinking that would be like, you can actually just track how much you are off from 34 as well after you draw yeah. up. And so if you have like a 30, 33 cards after you block, sorry, if you have you have four cards in your hand. Let's say you block with one card, you were playing 34. You can just play as though it's a 33 card deck from there. Yeah, yeah. That'll probably be the easiest way or the easiest shortcut for doing the pitch stack math. That being said, like, sometimes you would forget and, like, be like, oh, wait, did I only draw three cards a turn? Or, like, some, maybe, like, you were in a spot where you couldn't arsenal the card in your hand, so you drew up three cards. Like you do need to like make a mental note each time you do that. And one of like the top top players will be able to adjust these numbers uh, on will. But if you are gonna go on rails, it'll be just good to shackle every single turn and then like no matter no matter if you need it or not. And to just know that if you play 34 cards, every card you pitch should be blood deck cards so you can play them on your last turn. 
And for this reason, going first as chain is actually pretty okay, because sometimes you can just get like two premium. Like It's like a good opportunity to pitch red blood debt cards, for example, to the bottom of your deck, just to guarantee that you that you see those in your, in your last turn. So going first can be pretty nice, although I still think you prefer to go second, so there's less pressure on you. Yeah, yeah. I think I agree with that. Yeah, going for actually, I've never thought of it that way. If you go first and pitch some reds, it goes in your pitch stack. Yeah, that's that's pretty solid. That's pretty solid. Yeah, I, I don't think it's enough to make you want to go first, but just like we kind of we talked about this before on the going first or second episode. But chain is one of the decks that is pretty good at going first. Arguably, in CC, I think you just wanted to go first in draft. I don't think it is quite the case, but it's close. Mm-hmm. yeah it's just like in cc you got to like actually build a deck with like only a blood dead card so every card that you banish was like playable in draft it's not the case yeah and i think grasp is a big part of that too like as a pitch outlet that lets you like sometimes it's just hard to pitch two cards to the bottom of your deck depending like if you're pitching two reds to the bottom of your deck, you need to have a one cost that you can play. Otherwise, it's really awkward. Or like a two cost, I guess. Like if you have like all zeros, it doesn't it doesn't work. For example. Okay. Well, either way, even if once you know the pitch stack math, it gets a little bit easier. So practice with that. Just be wary that things can throw it off, and there's like a lot of different ways that can it can get thrown off. Be careful when that happens. As we said earlier when we were talking about the archetypes that the aggro version wants the specific cards I talked about, the combo and game version talks about the cards that they want. And if you've noticed that you can, the combo end game version really talks about playing blues and yellows. You can do that with also playing the aggro cards. The only difference would be that if you're like too heavily into aggro, you have too many like red rip through realities and red red rifted torments whereas in the combo ones you just want like blue versions of the cards so during the draft portion you do need to be pretty aware of like how many copies of which versions of cards you have and if you can actually set up a combo end game or not would probably be the easiest thing to easiest way to know which version you need to be on and i also sort of mentioned it that it's like a little bit of a sliding scale like i think you can have like a belittle brandish version that that goes wide early and then has not quite as strong of an end game and that's fine just i guess where it really breaks down is if you are searching with belittle repeatedly then you're going to ruin your pitch stack so if you're relying on belittle searching a lot then you really are the aggro version but if you are just playing like belittle primarily as a go again card and you know otherwise you're just utilizing go again with brandish and rifted torments and some of the two costs you you can definitely still play the the combo end game because again a lot of what you're pitching can be yellow or blue like i I might be looking to do like the yellow rip through reality yellow uh rifted torment set up with stubbies if you're doing that for example okay i guess uh we'll just move on and let's just talk about how to get into the deck yeah there's kind of a few ways i think that the biggest pulls into the deck that make me go like i really want to draft chain specifically is aether iron weave and soul reaping do you agree that those are kind of the two biggest reasons to be in chain yeah yeah i think so i think aether iron we've just gaining one life is so good and soul reaping just cards insane like you just if you have that like having that card or not having that card is just like i don't even know how to say it just like it's so good it's so good if you see that card it's probably a good reason to be in the chain yeah keep in mind it is legendary so you probably don't see two because it's a rare and it's short printed but it is technically legendary so you cannot pay you cannot play two of them even if you draft two of them. So keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that card is insane. And you should just, if you see it, you should pick it. Soul Reaping is a hard card to open. And let's say Aether Iron Weave doesn't get past to you. Is there any other ways to get into the deck? Yeah, I think after that, the other chain specific card that I'm really looking for is Seeds of Agony. Um, we said how the blue and yellow are especially good, but even the red one is like, I think, a very high pick. And um, I think especially if I'm seeing these around like pick three or four, I'm seeing that as a signal. Uh, Seeds isn't always like a card that you have to pack one, pick one, but it is a pretty high pick and it could be pack one, pick one, I guess, if you really want to go chain. Mm -hmm. And I think conversely, talking about 
if you see like a seeds pack one pick three that might be like a signal to move in that also means that if you are passing a seeds of agony in pack one pick two then you can probably assume somebody on your left will move into chain for those cards um because for chain to be really like above above the other decks they need to have the seeds of agony that's like a pretty good reason for them to move in so if you pass like two seeds of agony early in the draft you could probably assume that chain will be cut from your left after that and i think the same thing applies to aether iron weave and soul reaping although you should probably just be pack one pick winning those yeah that's fair another way to get into this deck just the shadow reds so ghostly touch howl from beyond and void wraith at red are all really good and all also have a place in Leviah, so they are a little bit more flexible so often i'm pretty inclined to pick these early in a pack and then i might move in for something like a seeds or i might have like a density of these shadow reds and it's just clear that chain is open um like i'm just seeing a, like a high density of chain cards and maybe there's like some solid ones like red rift bind red bounding demigon you know some of those cards that like aren't quite good enough to move into but are solid role players if i if i already have shadow reds and i'm seeing those late i'll just i'll pretty happily draft chain and I guess a uh, last way to get into chain would probably be the generics. Obviously, poppers go in all the decks, and you'll start with those. But belittle minnowism would be like a very strong reason to be in chain, as uh, chain is the one that gets to use the action point the best and the extra resources the best. If you start a draft with like, you know, multiple red belittles and a blue minnowism or a red minnowism, it would probably be like a good you have a strong reason to try and move into chain if possible. And then cards such as maybe like Rifted Tournaments or Rifted Realities will go up in value um, if you are more situated towards the aggro plan. I agree with all of that. So yeah, either you early pick a power card like Iron Weave, Soul Reaping, or Seeds, or you start a little more flexible with Shadow Reds or Generics and then move in when you see chain is open after that, I think are usually how we're getting into this deck. I think that if you are experienced with chain, you can do quite a bit with a little, but I do think that it it's not it's not so straightforward and I think most players will probably be most comfortable drafting chain if it's like two of like if there if there's two chains, the chain decks are very very good and I think they have enough raw power that like they're pretty approachable. When you start getting to like the three chain decks, like you start having to get pretty creative with what you're doing and you can get there if you're practice and you have experience but it's really hard and even if you do have that experience like you can just mess it up yeah you can lose to some some prison player that are playing multiple copies of impenetrable beliefs and blinding beams and <laughs> if they if they truly want to beat you and you're in a three chain pod they will beat you I guess that that's a good segue to just ask uh, how many chains do you think should be in a pod? Mm. Like, are you happy if you're the two chain or are you pretty happy if you're three chain? I think it's like two and a half where like two chain is actively really good. I think, I think if it... Welcome to On the Bubble Podcast, episode 40. I'm your host, Tsubasa J. Ueda, and with me is my co-host, Yuki Lee Bender. Today, we're going to be doing a deep dive into how to draft Chain for the Monarch draft. I guess that's it, right? We're only talking about Chain today. Yeah. Talk about Chain. Before that, we'll talk about our week. But yeah, we're just going to be doing our um, our Chain episode all about how to, you know, what are some of the key cards? What are some of the archetypes? How to play him? how to get into the deck, all those all those kinds of things. So it'll be, yeah, we'll be going deep on chain this week and then the other classes or heroes will be coming up next week. Awesome. Okay, then, uh, yeah, so how was your week, Yuki? My week's been pretty good. Played some Monarch draft on the weekend, did two drafts on Sunday and a draft on Monday as well. Played a whole bunch of stuff, drafted a Leviathan deck, a chain deck, a prism deck. So I've been getting some good practice in and it feels good to kind of get reps in the format we kind of mentioned last week that we've drafted this format a number of times but it as i was drafting it, i kind of realized like it's 
been a while since I drafted it. So definitely feel like I'm getting some of the rust off and things are coming back to me. Um, but it's been fun. I've been really enjoying kind of diving back into Monarch Draft. Didn't you say you were going to draft Bolton or force Bolton this week? Yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I was thinking about it. And then I realized that the problem was that I don't know what Bolton should look like. So I think think what I'm gonna have to do is try to build some like 30 card Bolton decks with commons and rares like maybe like two of each common and one rare uh, one of each rare kind of thing and see what that looks like just so I have an idea of what it is that I'm looking for because I feel like right now I'm just like I don't even know what a good Bolton deck looks like so it's like hard to know like I'm not exactly sure what to prioritize I know I know like take flight is good I know courageous steel hands pretty good um I know like valiant thrust is good and v and stuff but I'm not exactly sure about like the combination of cards and everything that's fair well I know what a good Bolton deck looks like now the this week on our first monarch draft uh one of the guys went into went 3 0 with Bolton with like the most broken Bolton deck I've seen so far. <laughs> he had Valiant yeah. Dynamo, V of the Vanguard, Spill Blood. Yeah, he was the only Bolton in the pod too. So he had like a bunch of take flights and just good cards. I played him twice with my pretty mediocre Leviathan deck that was playing like brandishes in it. The brandishes were actually pretty good. But, anyways, I played my pretty mediocre Leviathan deck and I just died on turn like three both games <laughs> <laughs> that's so crazy yeah it's just like he's just like uh yeah i'm gonna go first and uh charge my soul and i'm like okay cool hit you for some damage on his next turn he's hitting me for like 17 or something not even counting like the plus attack from the bolton stuff i'm just like oh cool <laughs> <laughs> guess i die <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah i guess we just go straight into the episode then? Yeah, we can do that. I think we got lots to talk about. Yeah, that sounds good. Do you want to go over like a key gameplay thing? We talked about this on the Monarch overview episode, but uh, let's just go over that to make sure everyone's on the same page. So kind of to summarize, Chain is definitely the kind of hero where you need to have a plan on how you're going to win the game and what that's going to look like. Because of the Soul Shackles, you usually get kind of about five turns, um, assuming you're shackling every turn, after which point like you're pretty much out of deck and unless you have them at like one with an arcane damage left in your deck or something, like you're you're no longer going to win that game. So you need to have a very clear plan of what that looks like. And we kind of talked about like the two major archetypes. We'll be going into each of those in more detail, but there's like a more aggressive archetype that can just kind of run its opponents over. And there's also a more combo pitch stack oriented build that can that can sort of do 20 plus damage on the last turn fairly reliably that being said it does take some amount of practice sequencing is important with the deck and it's a deck that hopefully after this episode you'll feel comfortable trying out but i would very much recommend drafting it a couple times before you play something like your nationals if you if you are playing that and trying to draft it because having a few reps on the deck and having seen how things play out a few times i think will, will just really help you kind of pick up the deck it's it's hard to do it on the fly and make it all work perfectly the first time i guess at least for me yeah no definitely it's a very difficult deck to do that it's it's gonna be quite difficult if you're gonna try playing the combo version you'll need to know your pitch deck and how the shackles affect your pitch deck it's uh pretty easy once you like get a hang of it but you it'll be near impossible to do that like if it's your first time picking up the deck and drafting it so Definitely, if you can't do drafts, at least just build like a 30 card draft chaff chain deck and see what these decks end up looking like. And trying that would probably like, it would help a lot in in being able to pilot the deck properly. Yeah, and if you do that, I think you can, if, if you do that, or if you draft chain and you have your deck left over, I think it's even the kind of deck you could consider goldfishing a few times just to like like with intentionally thinking through your pitch and what that looks like and seeing if you can just like remember what's in your pitch stack remember like think about setting up those end game turns to close out the game and 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 all of that i think if you just have the repetitions it's going to be a lot easier to do that when there's you know stakes and pressure and you know you're in a match that really matters this is another way you could go about practicing it yeah 
let's uh, just move right into the key cards for this deck. So how are we going to break this up? We're going to talk about just key cards that are good in all versions of Chain first. And then we'll talk about the actual archetypes later in the episode. So let's start with the best cards in the set for Chain. We're going to talk about the equipment first. It's going to be Ebon Fold, Aether Ironweave, and Stubbies. Those are the three equipment that you're going to be looking for to have a successful Chain deck, no matter what kind what kind of Chain you are. Yeah, and of these, I think Ebon Fold and Aether Ironweave are pretty high picks. Ebon Fold's pretty strong in either Leviah or Chain, so it's a flexible pick that is also powerful. And then Aether Iron Weave is just so good. Stubbies I do think is good in Chain, but I'm often picking it up a little bit later. Like I kind of want to it's kind of your reward for being Chain because I think that's the deck that it fits into best, although Bolton can also play it. I have also started to like Stubby Hammers and Prism now. Cards sweet everywhere I think, but that might be just like a later episode kind of topic. <laughs> yeah, Jay has discovered that you can just put Belittle Minoism in every deck, and why not? It's pretty good. Yeah, it helps you swing your auras with uh with Belittle. That that being said, let's uh talk about Aether Iron Weave a little bit more in detail. So this card is a uh, Rune Blade equipment chest, so only Chain can play it. It has Battle Swarm 1, so it just gains you one life right off the bat. That already is pretty broken. And it has an action ability that has go again that just generates you two resources if you've played a non-attack action and an attack action. So what this basically means though is that for you to effectively use Aether Iron Weave, you do need to play a non-attack action. So if you're planning to pop this off on your combo turn, you have to have a non-attack action incorporated in that turn. Uh, I guess for the non for the combo deck, it's just like there's no way you can kill your opponent with the non-attack actions anyways, right? Yeah, typically. I think there's like some different flavors of it, but you definitely do probably want to have a non-attack action at least. And sometimes, I actually had this on the weekend, I had a deck with like five non-attack actions. It was much lower than I'd like. In that deck, it just meant when I draw something like a red minnowism, I'm arsenaling that and saving it to the last turn because... Like, I just might not, like, I might just banish the rest of them and not see them kind of thing. So um, you can definitely, if you know that your pitch deck doesn't have non-attack actions, you can also kind of fix for it by arsenaling a card as well. Mm, I see, I see. Just, like, arsenaling and keeping it there so on your last turn you can pop off. Exactly, yeah. Okay, and then another, so then we're going to just talk about, move away from the 